Hey everybody, it's low carb and keto nutritionist Amy Berger here again for the next installment of how to do keto without the crazy. Um, standard disclaimer applies in this video as in all my videos, but especially in this video because of the nature of the topic. I'm not a physician, I'm a nutritionist, so I don't treat, cure, diagnose, or prevent any disease or medical condition. This is just advice and information. Um, I have, again, four pages of notes here. So this is gonna be another long video and I apologize because just when I think I'm finally done with all the really big topics and I can move on to things that'll only take like eight to 10 minutes a piece, no, then I think of something else that's not only really important, but that's lengthy and it's lengthy because it's important, right? If, if there's a really important topic, it needs to be dealt with properly. This is not something for a five minute or an eight minute soundbite. Um, so let's see any business before we get on. Mm, not really. Uh, I've had more furniture delivered, but I still haven't put the artwork on the wall. So I'm still recording in this little corner. You can see the doors behind me soon, soon there will be pretty stuff behind me besides that funky red couch. Um, I'm going to probably look down more than usual because I didn't really study these notes as much as I usually do before these videos. So please bear with me. Um, Today's topic is keto and mental health. If you are dealing with a mental illness or some kind of emotional distress, my heart truly goes out to you. Um, there's a lot of mental issues that I have not dealt with and I don't have personal experience with, but one thing I definitely have had is depression. And I know how debilitating it can be and that it can really touch every aspect of your life and I don't wish it on anybody. And assuming that any other form of mental distress, mental illness, psychological, whatever we want to call it, emotional instability, assuming that those are equally devastating and equally um, uncomfortable, for lack of a better word, truly, again, my heart goes out to you. Um, I hope you're getting help from professionals, but hopefully this video can also give you some information as to new things that you might want to explore that might help you. Um, you know, it's funny when somebody has a mental illness or some kind of psychological thing going on, it's, it's, it's no harder or easier than a physical illness, right? Than, than like a, a regular disease, but people that are dealing with a physical problem, right? If they're in a wheelchair, if they're using a walker, if they're on crutches, if maybe they have obesity, people can see right away that, oh, this person might need some special help. This person might need a certain accommodation. They might need a bigger chair. They might need help getting up the stairs, what have you. It's easy to tell that that person might need some extra loving, some extra attention, a hand, whatever. When somebody's dealing with something that seems like it's in our head, it's a lot harder to give credence to say, you know, I think that guy needs some help or, you know, she looks like she might need a friend because we don't see it. Um, but that doesn't make it any less terrible. It doesn't make it any less difficult to live with. It doesn't make it any less serious or dangerous. Um, so let's, we're all in this together. Let's be in this together. Um, so if, if you are dealing with something considered a mental illness or some type of emotional distress, I would put money down that it's not all in your head, right? And I don't mean that you're not making it up or you're just thinking bad thoughts. I mean, I know that that's not necessarily true for a lot of people. What I mean by saying it's not all in your head is that I would lay down money that you probably have physical symptoms in the rest of your body that you don't realize might be connected to the psychological symptoms and not just connected, but possibly coming from the same underlying cause, right? And um, any, you know, the symptoms run the gamut. The symptoms that I know of that are, you know, associated with things like depression or anxiety or bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or any, you know, probably any other sort of psychological mental thing we can think of, it's almost endless. It could be constipation, but it could be diarrhea. It could be brain fog. It could be um, acne, bloating, fatigue. Um, water retention, let's see, look at the notes, any kind of digestive problem, upset stomach, um, joint pain, 
And it, isn't it funny when you think that we we have the phrase butterflies in my stomach, right? Or at least in the US in English, we have that phrase. You might have something similar if you're watching this in another country. Um, but when when you're under emotional distress, what like let's say when you, you have to do public speaking or maybe when you were a kid and you had a band concert and you were gonna perform in front of everybody, the nerves are in your head. You're like, oh my God, I'm so scared. I hope I don't mess up. But where does it physically manifest? In the gut, right? Like some people believe in vomit. They will physically vomit or they'll have diarrhea or something. You get this crazy intestinal thing because of what you're thinking. So this is all connected. It's all connected. Um, and so what, what could be causing those kinds of things, the mental stuff and the physical stuff, again, could be anything, but so much of it can come from the food. Um, and I'll talk about, you know, we'll get into the details in a little bit, but let's sort of stay general for now. Now, it shouldn't surprise any of us that a lot of the things we consider to be mental illnesses or psychological issues do come hand in hand with some type of physical manifestation. Why should it not surprise us? The brain is inside your body, right? It's not like outside of it. Sometimes it probably feels like it's outside of your body, but it's actually inside the body. And, you know, there is something called the blood brain barrier. That's like this, this sort of force field of cells that is supposed to protect the brain from certain toxic compounds entering. And it's supposed to be very selective as to what it lets into the brain and what it keeps out. Um, you know, it lets in nutrients and oxygen and all this good stuff, and it keeps out all the bad stuff. But it doesn't always work perfectly. You've probably heard of leaky gut. Now they're looking into the, the possibility of leaky blood brain barrier. I don't know how solid the science is on that, but it's interesting to start looking at. And even when the blood brain barrier is perfectly intact, it's not like it's a 100% never fail defensive mechanism. I mean, stuff gets in there because it comes in the bloodstream and it comes with all the other stuff. Um, so just because there is a blood brain barrier doesn't mean that wacky weird stuff can't get through and affect the brain. And we know, we know that foods affect the body. We know this like super, super well. So there's no reason to believe that foods don't affect the brain. Right. Um, and let's see, let's see, looking at the notes again here. I mean, if, if you've ever been intoxicated, like from alcohol, you know food affects the brain. Um, if, if you're one of these people like me who can't live without your morning coffee, like you're not human until you've had, even, even two sips is enough to bring the humanity back into your, into your being, then you know caffeine um, has psychoactive properties. There's a lot of foods and beverages that have compounds that most definitely have physical and psychological effects. And if you don't think foods have physical and psychological effects and have psychoactive components, then you've probably never given a four-year-old a candy bar. Or like I said, you've, you're not one of those people that, that can't speak to another human until you've had your coffee or your tea. Um, you know, we, we know marijuana has, has THC. You know, that's something that we ingest and, and we have psychoactive results from it. Chocolate, cocoa has theobromine and something called PEA, P, like PPEA. Um, I think it's phenylethylamine. They call it the love chemical. That's why we all, we feel so happy and lovey when we eat chocolate or some of us do, women more so than men, right? Anyway, the point is, obviously foods have psychoactive components. How could anyone think that what we eat doesn't affect the brain? Um, and so, I'll just show you one little paper. What is it called? Bread and other edible agents of mental disease. Edible agents of mental disease. Like things you eat can cause you to be. Um, and that's, you know, that's not, I, I don't mean to offend anybody. It, um, we all, we all do this. And, and I don't mean like mm -mm, crazy. It's just like, of course we're affected by what we eat. Why wouldn't we be? So moving along to page two of the notes. Um, it's really interesting that this paper was specifically about bread because um, one of the strongest links that's been pretty firmly established in the scientific literature between food and, and a psychoactive or mental thing is that for many people, maybe not all, but in a, in a staggering number of people with schizophrenia, 
it is the primary manifestation of a gluten intolerance. And I know that sounds crazy. I know everybody's like, oh, gluten. Oh, ev all of a sudden, everybody's allergic to gluten, right? We went for like thousands of years, people were eating bread, no problem. All of a sudden, everybody's gluten intolerant. That's actually a thing. Schizophrenia and gluten sensitivity run, run hand in hand for a lot of people. Um, it's called gluteomorphine. It's one of the, like one of the substances that the gluten protein breaks down into gluteomorphine. If that reminds you of morphine, it's because it has like a psychoactive thing to it. And there's the same thing in casein, one of the proteins in, in milk and dairy products, they call it casomorphine. These are, you know, peptides, little like biochemical fragments of these, after these foods are digested, they're chopped up into like little tiny pieces that the bloodstream absorbs. Some of them get into the brain and do wacky things to our minds. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, as much as I love the ketogenic diet and low carb diets, I've said all the time, not everybody needs a ketogenic diet. Not everybody needs to live at 20 or 30 or even 50 grams of carbs a day. Plenty of people do fine on much higher carbs. And there's a lot of people with emotional and mental disturbances that improve a great deal just by doing like a paleo diet where they eliminate grains and dairy and legumes. Some people can do just gluten-free casein-free. They don't have to eliminate beans. They don't have to go low carb. They just go gluten-free casein-free. Um, there's something called the specific carbohydrate diet that was way popular several years ago. I think in the, in the sixties, maybe it was like the first iteration of, uh, what's now known as the gaps diet. So if you've ever heard of any of these, all of these are variations on elimination diets. Most of them are lower carb than a normal American diet, but they're not low carb by definition. And a lot of them, you can still eat fruit. Like I said, you can still eat beans, you can eat starchy, you know, tubers and starchy vegetables. But the point is they're all elimination diets of some ilk that, you know, some people respond to. If you eliminate the thing that, that you're, you know, not, not tolerating well, then you're gonna get better and you might not need a ketogenic diet. Now, with that said, <clears throat> of course, I am partial to the ketogenic slash low carb approach. And I have at least six reasons why. Um, so I'm gonna explain these six reasons. It's not like, oh, keto fixes everything and you should just do it. Oh, you have anxiety, do keto. You're depressed, do keto. No, there's actual legitimate reasons why this might work. And I say might work because there's no guarantees, right? I, I do love keto, but I am never going to say that it's a miracle cure for every single thing that anyone might be dealing with, because it's not. I wish it was. Wouldn't it be great if it was? Um, you know, if if you're familiar with Dr. Eric Westman, he's uh, he's been in this keto scene longer than almost anyone still active now. Um, he and his colleagues at Duke University did some of the earliest published medical research on what was at the time the Atkins diet. It was around 1998, very early 2000s. Um, but you know, he's still obviously very well known, gives lectures all over the all over the world, not just the country. But I once heard him say the greatest thing about keto, because it's true, you know, there is published medical research on keto helping, obviously, obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, PCOS, gout, hypertension, dyslipidemia, you know, like high, high, high triglycerides, low HDL. So keto is so good for so many different things, migraines, epilepsy, obviously, like so many things. And it starts to sound like snake oil. When you start saying, wow, keto helps so many things, you do start to sound like, oh, like, you're nuts. Like there's no way that a diet could do all that, but there is, that's what's so great. So the line that Dr. Westman said was, it's so unbelievable. You won't believe it, but I hope you do believe it. And that's why you're watching my channel. So, um, let's, let's talk about the specific reasons why keto might work for somebody with any kind of, um, mental distress or, or emotional distress, um, Mental illness is a loaded word. I know I've used that phrase in this video already. I'm hesitant to use it. I guess I should, there's no stigma against it. Um, so anyway, reasons why keto might be effective. Number one, so many, <clears throat> so many things that we attribute to being purely psychological or um, you know, emotional instability, in my opinion, <clears throat> are really unrecognized hypoglycemia. 
or hyperinsulinemia, wild ups and downs in blood sugar and insulin. And if you've ever had hypoglycemia, or maybe not even over hypoglycemia where your blood sugar was actually low, but you felt like it was low, and there's actually idea for another video. I'll talk about that in another video because hypo feeling hypoglycemic does not mean your blood sugar is actually dangerously low. It can come from other reasons. But nevertheless, when you've had those feelings, um, what happens? You get really angry, right? Irritable. I'm going to, I'm going to kill somebody if I don't eat in two seconds. You'll, you'll eat your own hand. You get irritable. You get angry. You get cranky. You get dizzy. You get nauseous. You get headaches, all kinds of stuff. Like so many emotional things that are coming solely from, from blood sugar. Um, and I, I think I'm not absolutely not dismissing the existence of true anxiety disorders, like people that, that can't leave the house, can't hold down a job, can't function without medication. But if you have like bouts of anxiety or um, especially rage, like unpredictable rage and anger, it could just be the blood sugar and insulin. So when we even this out, like instead of those wild ups and downs, we have just very nice little rolling gradual hills or just even a flat line for some people. I've seen the, the continuous glucose monitors from some people and like you can't even tell when they eat at all, it's just flat. That's gonna even out those emotional highs and lows because if the trigger is the low blood sugar or the crash because you have super high insulin so it tanks your blood sugar, it's like both hand in hand, um, then it stands to reason that evening that out can really help that. And of course, we see this all the time. There isn't a ton of published literature on it, but there um, certainly are anecdotes. And to me, you know, there's, there's a phrase out there, the plural of anecdote is data. And I kind of agree. I like to use the phrase anecdata. I didn't make that word up, but I like it because yeah, an anecdote, like like a story that somebody's telling about their personal experience is not published peer-reviewed science, but we, we shouldn't dismiss it. I mean, most experiments start from anecdotes and there's case, they call it a case report in the medical literature where they'll profile one patient. Hey, we had this one guy and this weird thing happened to him. Let's write it up in a journal. We had this one lady and she did this thing and it worked. Let's write her up. Those are anecdotes until the, the researcher puts their name on the paper and they get published. So let's not dismiss the anecdotes, okay? Um, so let's see what else. Yeah, so the reason I think that stuff, the, the hypoglycemia can trigger this stuff is because this is exactly what happens in seizures. The key, for those of you who were new to the ketogenic diet, the ketogenic diet was not originally intended as a weight loss diet or a diabetes diet or a PCOS diet or anything. It was an epilepsy diet. It was known since ancient times that fasting was very, very effective for um, you know, preventing seizures. And the, it, was, it was realized eventually in like the 1920s that the ketogenic diet mimics fasting. And it does this in many, many ways. But one of the, the most important is that it evens out those crazy ups and downs in the sugar and insulin. Um, so you can get, keto lets you get the benefits of fasting without actually fasting. And I did a video on fasting. You can look on my channel and search for it. Fasting definitely does have some effects that, that a ketogenic diet doesn't. But overall, you can get many of the benefits of fasting just through keto. And so for some epileptic people, children and adults, a trigger for a seizure for them could be a drop in blood sugar right? And that could come from different foods. It could come from being sick. It could come from all different things that affect the blood sugar. But that's one of the, the triggers for seizures. Um, number two, why keto might help. Increased GABA production, GABA, G-A-B-A, -A, gamma aminobutyric acid. Um, G-A-B-A -A is known as the most calming neurotransmitter. So we think of like, I don't know which ones are excitable, like, I don't know, maybe ep epinephrine, norepinephrine, like, oh, things that you know, things that kind of like rile you up, GABA is the one that, or adrenaline, I guess, adrenaline is, you know, the, the fight or flight, um, that's cortisol too. There's a lot of hormones that make you want to fight or flee. GABA is the one that calms. Um, and ketogenic diets have been shown to increase GABA production. And it, you know, GABA will be produced in the brain and you will be more calm. Number three, um, possibly, getting more micronutrients. Um, 
a B12 deficiency alone could cause depression, could cause anxiety, could cause neurological things, could cause brain fog, could cause cognitive impairment. Um, a zinc deficiency can do a lot of that same stuff. An iron deficiency can do a lot of that same stuff. So, you know, when, for me as a nutritionist, when I think about nu nutrient deficiencies, I'm not thinking about like scurvy. This isn't, you know, the 1700s and we're on some ship and we haven't had a piece of fruit or something in like two years, which that whole fruit thing and vitamin C is a little iffy anyway. That's another topic for another video. But the point is, we don't really see things like beriberi and pellagra and rickets. We don't really see that anymore in the industrialized world, except just as a little aside, we do see this in some people on very long term vegan diets and um, children being raised on vegan diets and and children being born to vegan mothers who were vegan throughout pregnancy and vegan while breastfeeding i i don't recommend it it's couples have been arrested in europe for child endangerment child abuse for that very reason that's that's a loaded topic that's all i'll say about it but let's get back on track because nutrient deficiencies or what i would call maybe an insufficiency or a subclinical deficiency meaning you might just because you don't have scurvy and your gums aren't bleeding doesn't mean you are getting enough vitamin C. Just because you don't have the three Ds of pellagra, which I think is dementia, diarrhea, and death, just because you don't have those doesn't mean you're getting enough niacin, right? Pellagra is a B3 deficiency. Um, <clears throat> just because you're not literally falling apart at the seams physically doesn't mean you are optimal right like when my thyroid problem was at its worst and my depression was at its worst i could still get up and get dressed and leave the house and go about my life i hated doing it i didn't want to do it i was miserable every second but i could do it just because i could function and i was still alive didn't mean i was well it didn't mean i was healthy it didn't mean i felt good it didn't mean things were optimal um so when you go on a ketogenic diet, depending on what you eat, because let's face it, you could construct a ketogenic diet out of garbage, but most people for the most part will eat real food. So even if you were eating some of the specific foods I'm gonna mention now on a standard American diet, you might be eating more of them on a ketogenic diet than you were, or because you're probably not eating a lot of grain, if any, and a lot of beans, if any, you've eliminated a large source of what we call anti-nutrients. There are things, there are compounds in grains and beans and legumes that inhibit absorption of certain minerals. I, they might inhibit vitamins too, I'm not sure, don't quote me on that. I know they inhibit the absorption of things like magnesium, calcium, zinc, and iron. Um, and there are, some of these compounds do exist in some of the keto-friendly foods like spinach and Swiss chard and um, a lot of the leafy greens for the most part. Um, I think blueberries have some of them too. So it's not that you're eliminating them altogether, but your intake of foods that contain high amounts of these anti-nutrients is probably much lower than it was. And so if your ketogenic or low carb diet includes generous amounts of beef, pork, poultry, seafood, especially if you're eating organ meats, eggs, then like you're off to the races in terms of nutrient content. Um, I know we focus a lot on the carbs, carbs, fat, protein, the macros, you know, and we don't give as much airtime to the micronutrients. That's, that's macronutrients is protein, carbs, and fat. Micronutrients is vitamins and minerals, um, but they're equally important. Um, some, some people might even say they're more important. I, I don't know where I stand on that, but if, if, you, if by adopting a low-carb or ketogenic diet, you've corrected a deficiency or an insufficiency, now you're getting the amount of whatever that nutrient is that you were missing. So if you were manifesting some type of issue because of an inadequate level of that thing, whatever it was, you've, you've corrected it and now you feel better. Like this shouldn't surprise us that you feel better. Now, obviously, in that case, a ketogenic diet isn't the only way to do this. You could correct those imbalances through a lot of other kinds of diets um, but that's just one more aspect of keto that could be contributing to the like wildly improved mental health that we hear about and see in the published research on keto um number four also oh oh no back back to number three back to the nutrients or maybe this is back to 
kind of back to number one, correcting the blood glucose and insulin. That's what happens when I write the notes out of order. Um, did you know that hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia, chronic, I, I don't mean just acute one time here and there every now and then, when you have sort of chronic all the time, high blood sugar and high insulin, it increases your need for certain nutrients. So, okay, this is, this is number one and number three, hand in hand. When your body is burning through so much glucose, you use up magnesium like a champ. You use up chromium like a champ. You use up all these other nutrients because like the, the metabolism of glucose requires certain other things. Like if you even look at the, the biochemical reactions, some of these enzymes require magnesium as a cofactor. They require zinc, they require manganese, um, and they require the B vitamins. So, when you're burning through a ton of glucose all the time on a high carb diet, you need higher amounts of that stuff. So when you go on a low carb diet, you've corrected the chronically high sugar and insulin. Now it's like nice and normal. And you might be getting more of those nutrients, but even if you weren't, even if you're only getting the same amount as before, because you are no longer chronically hyperglycemic and hyperinsulinemic, the amount you were getting is now enough, whereas before it was not. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so number four, <clears throat> number four has to do a little bit with the same reason why keto works so well for epilepsy. Um, when neurons communicate with each other, they sort of fire out the end of one and it's picked up at the ends of another. And this isn't really, this is kind of what it looks like. This is a little schematic, but it like, boo, like sends out the little signal and it's received to the next one, boo, passed to the next one. And that happens trillions of times in the brain. Uh, well, in some of our brains more than others, right? <laughs> um, in epilepsy, so in order for that stuff to happen, different it's it's kind of a long story but to keep it brief and and like sensible for this video electrolytes and different minerals right outside and just inside the cell have to be in the right proportion um when they're not things can misfire so when a neuron is supposed to fire maybe it won't fire or when it's not supposed to fire maybe it does fire um, when stuff is not supposed to fire and it fires we call that hyper excitability um, and this, this happens in epilepsy a lot, like, pew, stuff is firing when it's not supposed to fire. And so what the ketogenic diet does by correcting some of these electrolyte balances, not, not necessarily because you're getting more electrolytes like sodium, potassium, and magnesium, not, not because you're getting more of them, but because the way the ketogenic diet changes you biochemically all over the inside, it like adjusts and corrects stuff that isn't the way it's supposed to be. Um, so what, what keto does for epilepsy, is there's many, many mechanisms, including the, the reduced glucose and insulin, including the higher GABA, but for epilepsy specifically, they call it hyperpolarization of the neuronal membrane. And all that means is like, it's hyperpolarized. It's like hyper means high, right? Big, too much. So let's think of it that way. So instead of the neurons being like, pew, 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 fire, it's like that. And this is, this is not what it looks like. This is not to scale. This is not a real life representation. This is just like a, just to, to sort of demonstrate what I'm even talking about. So instead of neurons beep, 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 firing and up, keto hyperpolarizes that membrane. So it might still fire, but it's not going to fire as much or as often. And whatever the trigger is that makes that person seize, it's going to take more of it for them to have a seizure because the membrane is now hyperpolarized. It's going to take more effort for them to, for them to have a seizure. Um, so I find that fascinating. Um, that's, that's about all I know, um, of that mechanism. There is, there is more to it. Um, but that's, that's enough to at least explain one more mechanism. And so if that happens in epilepsy, why don't we think that that could have other effects in the brain? Maybe, a very similar mechanism is at work in people that have panic attacks or anxiety attacks. And I'm speculating, to be clear, I'm speculating. We don't know. We don't know that this is the mechanism, but it wouldn't surprise me if that was at least related. Um, if, if some of these, these neurons that again, are either firing when they're not supposed to, or, um, you know, not firing when they are supposed to could lead to 
depression, could lead to cognitive impairment, could lead to anxiety, panic, all this stuff. Uh, number five, why keto might work. Obviously, the most obvious to me, except for evening out the blood sugar and insulin, is that ketones are brain food. Can I say that again? Ketones are brain food, and I'll say it a third time. Ketones are brain food. Um, I wrote a whole book about this. If you're curious about the role, the potential role anyway, of a ketogenic diet for Alzheimer's disease, go on Amazon and check out my book. It's called The Alzheimer's Antidote, and it is um, about using a low carb or ketogenic diet as a nutritional therapy for Alzheimer's. Um, and the reason is because ketones are really good at fueling the brain. Um, you'll often hear that ketones are, are like a backup fuel or an emergency fuel. Um, that's not really true. Ketones are an elegant, beautiful, perfectly normal, perfectly safe human energy fuel substrate, a thing that we burn. And um, when you're on a ketogenic diet, even when your ketones aren't that high, even when they're only a little bit elevated, they will get into the brain. The brain loves ketones and it sucks them up like a sponge. Um, I'm going to have a lot of links in the notes for this episode. And um, one of the links I will have is a talk from Dr. Stephen Kunain, whose work is absolutely outstanding. Oh my God. I quote the heck out of him in my book. I quote him in every talk I ever give about Alzheimer's. I will share a link to a video he did basically showing that ketones are the brain's preferred fuel, or if not the preferred fuel, because that's, that's a loaded term. Um, again, idea for another video. Um, when, when the blood ketone level is higher, the brain takes up ketones. So to whatever extent, and again, I'm, I'm only speculating, but to whatever extent some of these mental and emotional things might be coming from a lack of fuel to the brain, which a lot of people have, not just people with Alzheimer's. We see this in people as young as their 30s and 40s. Their brains are not taking up as much glucose as what we call like healthy controls. Um, there's no reason to suspect that those people wouldn't have an issue from that, from what we call depressed cerebral glucose metabolism. If the brain is not getting enough glucose and there's no other fuel around, you're in trouble. But if you have ketones coming in, no problem. Um, so I think I think that's a big part of it too. And again, I'm not, <clears throat> this, this isn't certain. I don't even know if they've researched this. It's specifically in the context of mental illness or whether it's anxiety, panic, depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, what have you. I don't know if anyone's tried to measure the cerebral glucose uptake like they've done in, um, they've done it in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis. And in all three of those, the brain and the central nervous system are not getting the normal amount of glucose. So um, feeding, feeding a starving, struggling, atrophying, depressed brain, ketones could be very helpful. Number six, because I'm already at 32 minutes, but I knew this was gonna be long. Um, the neuropharmacology of the ketogenic diet, right? Neuropharmacology of the ketogenic diet. When you hear neuro, think brain right we know the ketogenic diet is is a really really promising strategy for various neurological conditions especially epilepsy we know that's well established i think the alzheimer's research is small but extremely promising i i th i think it's the single best most promising thing we have now at all for it in fact um, you know, but there is a lot of other things, traumatic brain injury, um, or CTE, chronic traumatic encephal encephalopathy, like the, the chronic concussions, the football players, the head injuries, um, so many other things like, you know, again, Parkinson's, there's some published papers on keto and Parkinson's that are pretty promising. So when you hear neuro think brain, and I mean, these papers, like I'll, I'll, again, I'll put some links in the notes to, to several of the papers that I like. I don't know how much of, how many of you care about the science, how many of you want to read it, but I just want to like prove to you, I'm not making this stuff up. You know, look, GABA, GABA systems. I don't know if it's blurry or not on the video, but you know, like all these different things that the ketogenic diet does, right? Ion channel, neurotransmitter synthesis, effects on ion channels and proteins associated with synaptic transmission right can we do we see that i mean no big deal but synaptic transmission that's what i'm talking about with like the synapses the hyper polarizing those synaptic membranes um it's all here it's all here so 
this is a well-known thing for neurological things. And there's, they got neuropharmacology. I mean, this diet kind of acts like a drug. If you could patent a drug that did everything the ketogenic diet does, you'd be a kajillion, bajillion, quadrillionaire. Uh, but you can't do it. You can't do it. There are drugs that reduce blood pressure, but they mess you up in other ways. There are drugs that reduce blood glucose. They mess you up really bad in a lot of other ways. There's drugs that can give you an erection. If you have trouble getting an erection, they might give you some other problems. You know, any, any drug tends to come with some unfortunate and unintended side effects. And the ketogenic diet, you know, the side effect is that you lose weight and you get to eat delicious food. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there is published, moving on, moving on page three of notes. There is published literature, like peer reviewed scientific papers showing that keto can help schizophrenia, bipolar, anxiety. And I wrote down depression here. I don't know about that, but um, migraines, believe it or not, migraines, some people consider migraines to be a neurological disorder. And based on the research I've seen, I would agree. I, I had to write a training module for other nutritionists on uses of the ketogenic diet. And I had a, a little blip there on migraines. There was a really interesting study of um, two twin sisters that adopted a ketogenic diet to lose weight. And the unexpected happy little side effect was that their migraines went away. These were two chronic migraine sufferers. Um, and their migraines went away on keto. So um, that was kind of cool. So to the extent that that is also like a neurological brain thing. Um, okay, now, now we're getting into some very important and interesting stuff. And I'm sorry that it's already 36 minutes in. Um, I've been talking a lot about mental illness and I've been just dropping words like anxiety, bipolar, depression, schizophrenia, panic attacks. Um, I don't want, I don't mean to make light of this at all. So if anyone has gotten the impression that I'm just joking around or just casually using these words, I'm not. And we know that diet is not always the cause of this. I think diet plays a huge role and its role is terribly underappreciated, but it's not everything. Um, there's a lot of factors you know the factors that we know about that you hear about all the time whether in the ketogenic world or the paleo world or just the health world in general you know inadequate sleep um inadequate sunlight inadequate physical activity just getting up and moving and breathing especially outside in the fresh air um and it could be you know a, a lack of i mean well i'll get to some other stuff in a minute but there's something called um Adverse Childhood Events, ACE, and some healthcare professionals use an ACE questionnaire. And it's basically to try to identify if somebody had some type of very terrible trauma in their past. And it doesn't have to be a childhood event. It's, it's called the ACE questionnaire, but this could happen to you in adult life as well. You could suffer a very severe trauma. It could be a physical trauma. You could have been physically abused. It could have been a sexual trauma, some kind of assault, some kind of emotional neglect, something that is the trigger for your thing whatever thing you're dealing with and that can of course also have physical manifestations like i said i don't it's never just in the mind it's going to affect you somewhere else in the body too and the thing is as much as i love keto and i do love it you know keto can't undo that trauma it can't remove that from your life it can't excise it it can't transplant it elsewhere unfortunately um, so you, you have to get help in other ways. Keto is one way to help yourself because I, keto cannot undo the trauma. It can't erase it from your past. It can't make it all better. What it can do, in my opinion, is make you better able to cope by evening out the blood sugar, by giving you the critical nutrients that you need to support the healthiest and most robust brain function and emotional stability that you can have. I do think keto can make you more resilient. It can make you uh, more empowered to deal with what you have to deal with and, and maybe more empowered to seek the other help that you might need. Um, when you start to feel a little bit better from keto and maybe you've been like putting off seeing a psychiatrist or, or a therapist or something, maybe feeling a little better in some way allows you to take further steps to heal in whatever way you need to heal. So um, 
if I, I'm going to say something very uncomfortable now, but it's something that needs to be said. And <clears throat> sorry, I'm clearing my throat so much. I'm just getting over a cold. Um, so keto doesn't fix everything. Sometimes you still get a cold. <laughs> um, something I see from time to time in clients, and it's hard to bring up, but it has to be brought up. Diet doesn't fix your life. If you are living in an unhappy marriage, an unfulfilling marriage, a sexless marriage, and you don't want a sexless marriage, like you're actually interested in sex, or some people are perfectly fine sleeping in separate beds, they have no sexual interest, that's cool, hey, to each their own. If you are trapped in a job you hate, if you wake up every day thinking, oh my God, I can't take one more day of this. I've been there, I know how that feels only too well. If Sunday night comes and you're already dreading Monday morning, or better yet, Saturday night comes, it's not even Sunday, and you're already thinking about how bad Monday is going to be, keto doesn't fix any of that. So if there's something that's really affecting you emotionally that has nothing to do with what you're eating, you have to address that thing in some other way. You need counseling or... I can't tell you how many working moms or stay-at-home moms or single moms, what have you, I see that are burning the candle at both ends, but not just both ends. If that candle had 10 ends, they'd be burning the candle at 10 ends. They don't know how to say no to anybody. They don't know how to just tell everyone to off and do their own thing for a night. Some of the, these women, some of these women don't need a ketogenic diet. They need a babysitter and they need a night off once a month. Um, that's just the way it is. If you are stressed to the max and you're never getting any rest and nobody respects you and nobody's listening to you and nobody is caring for you, you're caring for everyone and everything and every day and no one's ever helping you, the ketogenic diet isn't going to help that. You need to stand up for yourself. You need to, you know, have a frank but very diplomatic, very loving conversation with the people around you and make some changes. And that's not just women. I'm not excluding the men. There's plenty of men that work hard, that are raising their kids, that are on their own, whatever. If, if this describes you in any way, maybe you don't even have kids. I don't have kids, but I have a pretty easy life. Um, but I'm just saying there are certainly definitely reasons way beyond diet that diet can't fix. Again, I think it can help you cope better, but it ain't going to fix it. You know, all the grass-fed butter in the world and all the, you know, pasture-raised pork and omega-3 eggs in the world are not going to give you a divorce if you need a divorce or they're not going to find you a new job. Unfortunately, that's a step you have to take on your own. The coconut oil can't can't do that for you. Um, so I'm going to, oh, coming up 42 minutes. I got to hurry. What I would say to anyone suffering from a mental illness or any kind of emotional distress who's watching this is give keto a try. Give it a try. What do you have to lose? Even if you're on medication, you're probably not 100%. You probably don't feel your best. Um, unfortunately, a lot of psycho, you know, psychiatric medications don't help. Um, some They help some people, right? Some people, they're life-saving. And I don't want to dismiss the importance of medication. But for some people, they do nothing. They try four or five, eight different medications. Nothing ever works. Or um, if it does work, it comes with side effects that are so debilitating that they, they're just unable to keep taking the medication. So if you are on medication, and even if you're not on medication and you want to adopt a ketogenic diet, please work with a qualified medical professional who can help you adjust the medication if necessary. I did, my, uh, I did a video on that um, not long ago. You can search for that keto and medication. Um, so you might not want to do this on your own, but let's see, let's see. I mean... Assuming your medication is properly monitored, I've never heard of the ketogenic diet making anything worse. It either helps or it's neutral and it does nothing. It, it, I've never heard of it making anything worse. There's rare cases where it makes things worse when people aren't doing it properly and they and, and all they need is like to course correct. But that's not the fault of the ketogenic diet. It was just implemented in, incorrectly. Um, when, when the ketogenic diet is implemented properly and you're eating the right foods and you're doing the right thing, 
I've just never heard of anybody getting worse. So you're either gonna feel a little better, you're gonna feel friggin' awesome, or you're gonna feel the same. You literally have nothing to lose except your morning bagel, your morning latte and scone, um, your three o'clock sugar fix, that's what you have to lose. But what you have to gain is emotional stability and mental clarity and brain evenness, sharp thinking, whatever's missing, you have the potential to gain it. Again, no promises, no guarantees. Why don't you just give it a try? If you guys know Rob Wolf from, um, he wrote the book, The Paleo Solution, and he also wrote a book called Wired to Eat. He's awesome, R-O-B-B, two Bs, Rob Wolf. Um, he, he calls it the greasy used car salesman pitch, like, give it a try for 30 days, you know, give it a try and come back if you don't like it. Um, I would say give it, give it 60 days for something like a mental or emotional thing. I, I would give it more than 30 days. I would expect if you were going to be helped by keto, you would notice it within 30 days, but just in case not, I would say give it 60. Some of this mental stuff, as you know, can be really, really hard to deal with. And maybe you do need a little more time for this to work its magic. Um, but again, I emphasize like work, work with the doctor, with the meds, because some of these psych, you know, psychotropic and psychological medications are not supposed to be stopped cold turkey. You have to taper, please work with a professional. Okay. And thank God there are psychiatrists who do keto. Again, I will put them in the notes. I will have links to their websites. There's one, uh, Georgia Ead MD. She's awesome. She's up in Massachusetts and she's seeing clients privately. Now you can do a long distance consult with her. Um, Ignacio Cuaranta in Argentina, para mis amigos que hablan al español. He's in Argentina. Um, there's another guy, I forget his name, but there's, um, there are mental health professionals that support keto, which is awesome. Um, Georgia Eid, her, her site is diagnosisdiet.com, all written out together, diagnosisdiet.com. She, it, it's a stunning, stunning stunning wealth of information. You will fall into that website and never come out, which is fine. Um, she also writes a column on psychology today that's that's really cool. Um, Emily Deans, D-E-A-N-S, also up in Massachusetts is another, I think she's a psychiatrist, but she's also an MD that's low carb friendly. Um, now, gonna wrap up soon, but if you've heard of the carnivore diet, this is like keto on steroids. It's people that literally only eat animal foods. They eat nothing from the plant kingdom, not even olive oil, not even coconut oil, not even almonds, nothing. Some of them make exceptions for coffee and tea and like red wine and spirits. Most of them just eat animal products. And there's been some very preliminary, again, anecdotal, very early stage reports from people having I guess what I would call remission or, or lessening of um, addictive behavior, addictions to porn, to gambling, to alcohol, people that really were big drinkers all of a sudden didn't want to drink anymore or didn't want to look at the porn anymore. Again, very preliminary, um, no real science on this yet, but it's interesting, just interesting stuff. And so with that in mind, self-help is not a dirty phrase. Self-help is not a dirty word. I have lots of self-help books that have helped myself. Um, <laughs> it's, you don't have to be embarrassed to go to the self-help section at the bookstore. And if you do feel embarrassed, great thing we can all order books online now and you don't even have to be seen. Nobody has to see you flipping through those books like, oh my God, I need help, what can I do? Um, I wanna recommend the work of Louise L. Hay, H-A-Y. I think she passed away two years ago, maybe three years ago. She is a national frigging treasure. She is an Amy Berger personal treasure. She's an author or was an author and she's got these card decks that each card has like a, a positive affirmation on it and like a saying like, I am, I am totally adequate for all situations. You know, maybe I'll do another video just on some of this because it's, um, I'm running out of time. I don't want this to be more than an hour. Um, I personally love Louise Hay's stuff. Not all of it, but, I take what resonates and I leave the rest. You might find somebody like Wayne Dyer to, to be more, uh, you know, it just fits you better. Or somebody like Eckhart Tolle who wrote The Power of Now. There's no shortage of these authors and bloggers and speakers who, um, even, even Tony Robbins, right? Um, Awaken the Giant, I think he wrote Awaken the Giant, Awaken the Giant Within, something like that. The guy that does the fire walks, he's a little kooky, but he's really powerful. Like he will get you fired up. 
Um, so find what works for you. There's no right or wrong. There's no good or bad. There's only what works for you and what helps you get out of the hole you feel like you're in. And I, I hope you can get out of there because I've been there and I've been there for so long. And I can tell you that life above and outside of the hole is so much better than life inside that hole. <sighs> One more thing to say before, well, two more things. If you are dealing with some of this stuff and you're at your wits end, maybe you've even already done keto and it's not going away. I recommend trying an organic acids test. Um, I'm not sure if you can get it out of, outside of the US, but in the US, you can order it through a practitioner that has an account with the lab. I, I am one such practitioner. If you're interested in this, you can email me at toitnutrition at gmail.com. Um, it's very pricey, but it's worth it. It's worth it if you are dealing with an issue or multiple issues that don't seem to get any better no matter what you do. And nobody can explain why they're happening to you. No one can tell you what to do because nothing's worked. Um, it's, in, in a nutshell, it measures, it, it's a urine sample and it measures all kinds of metabolites. And these metabolites indicate roadblocks in various biochemical processes that can indicate that you might be short in a certain nutrient or have an overabundance of a certain nutrient or um, are not making enough of a certain neurotransmitter. Um, it's really fascinating, pricey, but fascinating. Um, I did it myself just to see what it was like and when I was going through some stuff. And their lab included in the price of the test is like a 30 minute consultation with their labs experts to go through your results and they can explain them to you. I don't know if they make any actual recommendations, but they can at least explain what it means. And then you can work with somebody like me who can maybe make some recommendations. I don't know. Um, I also recommend um, if you have anxiety or depression or anything like that, get a B12 check, get your B12 level tested. Um, if your B12 in the blood is normal, get what is called MMA, urinary MMA, methylmalonic acid. If that's elevated, you are B12 deficient. Um, it's kind of a long story, but the B12 alone can cause all kinds of mental, cognitive, and emotional stuff. Um, my favorite book on this is Could It Be B12 by Sally Patchelock and Jeffrey Stewart. Um, I'll put a link on that um, to that in the notes as well. It is a fascinating book, blew my mind. Um, kind of terrified me a little bit too, but blew my mind. And be aware, if you get your B12 tested, be aware, in a lot of labs, the reference range is like from 200 to 900 or 200, I think it's picograms per milliliter. Don't quote me on that. I don't remember the units, but it's like 200 to 900 or something. If you're a two or 300, you are deficient, period. The experts in B12 want to see you above 400. And if you are dealing with a specific thing, they want you above 500. So the reference range, just like I talked about in my thyroid video, normal does not mean optimal. The reference ranges are sometimes way too wide. They need to be much narrower. So you might be flagged as normal, but you're actually deficient. Um, I would also, if you specifically are dealing with depression, get a comprehensive thyroid panel. And if you don't know what that is, check out my thyroid video that I did not long ago. Um, that's why my depression happened. I mean, I am naturally a pessimist and I'm a melancholy person. I'm kind of a quiet negative person, but the negative emotions I experienced when my hypothyroidism was at its worst were orders of magnitude worse than anything I've ever experienced in my life. And the first symptom that started to get better when I got on the right dose of thyroid medication for myself. The first symptom that went away was a depression. I felt better emotionally and I said, oh my God, I think it's working. I think I'm getting better. The constipation didn't go right away. The hair loss didn't stop right away. The thing that happened first was my mood got brighter. Thank the heavens. Um, all right, I'm coming up on 53 minutes. So that's going to be it for now. Um, if you want, I'll, I'll put a link to the organic acid test as well. You can find out about it. the description on the lab's website is really long and really wordy. So you might want to skip what's at the beginning and skip to the bottom, but you can just skim if you want. Um, you can see what that's all about. Thank you for watching. I really, really hope to start making shorter videos. I didn't I didn't intend to make hour long videos, but this, this is a really important topic and I, I think you'll agree. Um, 
If you like these videos, please subscribe. And um, I don't have a Patreon account, but if you find these videos helpful, you are more than welcome to shoot me a couple of dollars on uh, PayPal, paypal.com. You can send to my email address, twoitnutrition at gmail.com. Buy me my next cup of coffee or my next steak. Keep me, uh, keep me well caffeinated and well fed on low carb food so I can keep making videos. Um, I have a newsletter now. I just started a newsletter. I'm gonna try to send out at least once a month and knowing me, that's probably all I'll be able to do. So um, no spam. I don't, I don't even know how to spam you if I wanted to. So uh, once a month, you'll get an email from me with uh, links to whatever blog posts I've written in that time, public appearances where I'll be speaking or where I'll just be hanging out. You can come meet me in person. Um, books I've been reading, whether they're low carb or not, stuff that I just think is cool to read. Most of it'll be low carb and health and nutrition in general related, but um, where will I be next? This weekend, I will be in Los Angeles at the Metabolic Health Summit with like the world's leading experts in keto. I am not one of them. I am attending, I'm not presenting. People like Stephen Kunain and Eric Westman are presenting. That's how you know this is the real deal. So um, that's it. Thank you for watching. If you are struggling with mental health, my love to you, my virtual hugs to you, and uh, let's, let's be kind to each other. Bye.